also talk about the importance of the Bible in which women are deemed subservient. No, they're not. That's complete, that's complete rubbish. All right, let's see it. How in the world could you possibly derive that idea from biblical readings? Well, you can start with Genesis 3.16, where women are cursed to be ruled over by their husbands as one of the conditions of the fall. You can go into the rest of the Pentateuch, where the overwhelming majority of the legislation is addressed specifically to men, where women are treated largely as NPCs, as appendages to uh, the agency and the personhood of men. Uh, and you have places like Leviticus 27, where a female slave is valued at only 50 to 60 percent of the value of a male slave, depending on the age. And this is actually a departure from some other Southwest Asian laws where male and female slaves have the exact same value. Uh, then you can go into the rest of the Hebrew Bible, where the society is overwhelmingly patriarchal, where the leaders and the important figures and the influencers are almost exclusively male. And then we get into uh, the New Testament. We're still in a patriarchal society. Uh, we have the spurious Pauline epistles that are frequently appealed to as proof texts by misogynists today that explicitly subordinate women to men. Uh, and there are some intrusions, some interpolations into the uh, genuine Pauline epistles on the part of these authors as well. Now, that is not to say there are no important exceptions. There are queens, there are prophetesses, there are apostles, there are deaconesses, there are a lot of female leaders who do important things in the biblical text. And when we ignore those, we distort the picture that the Bible paints. But it also distorts the picture the Bible paints to ignore the programmatic, the prescriptive subservience of women to men throughout the majority of the Bible. The most fundamental statement in the Bible, and this is a miraculous statement, it's, it's absolutely incomprehensible that it was written some thousands of years ago. Men and women are made in the image of God. So this is Genesis 126 from the priestly stratum of the Pentateuchal literature, and the priestly authors were not in any sense trying to achieve full parity between women and men on a social level or in terms of the relationship of humanity to deity, but this does represent an innovation and elaboration on broader ancient Southwest ideologies regarding the relationship of humanity to deity. But the idea of being in the image of God is not unique to P or to the biblical literature. That is something that was diffused throughout ancient Southwest Asia. However, it was usually consolidated in the person of the king. And to be in the image of the God meant to be the image, the divine image, the idol. In other words, to be the material index or locus of divine presence, divine power, divine sovereignty. And so to say all humanity is the image of God is to uh, democratize that status as the image of God from the king to all humanity and to say you are all the images of God, therefore don't worship the material images being created uh, for the purposes of um, manifesting the presence of deity in the societies around you. So that democratization served the rhetorical goals of the priestly authors. It is to say, don't go worship the king. The king is not the only index for divine power and sovereignty, and don't go worshiping uh, other human-made idols. So all of this is not to say that these passages cannot or should not be renegotiated to achieve more parity between women and men. I've advocated directly in the past for that by pointing out that if you can look in the Bible and find a God who does not approve of slavery, you can also look in the Bible and find a God who does not approve of subordinating the authority of women to men. What my argument is, is that to hold up one single proof text and to furtively assert the presupposition of univocality without addressing any of those other passages is to just deny that those things subordinate women to the authority of men, which gives cover to folks who would weaponize the Bible 
to subordinate women to the authority of men. It gives them cover to say, no, men and women are both created in the image of God, therefore equal. Therefore, what Paul says is part of God's equality. Therefore, what Genesis 3.16 says is part of God's equality. Therefore, what Leviticus says is part of God's equality. To deny that the rest of the Bible subordinates women to men is to give cover to people to subordinate women to men in the name of God's equality. And that is phenomenally harmful and phenomenally ignorant.